Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. My name is Glenn Starkman, and I am the director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, which is a partnership among the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, Case Western Reserve University, and IdeaStream, uh, whose mission is to advance and promote the scientific understanding of origins from the Big Bang to human origins, from evolutionary medicine to the origin of thought and to new and future beginnings. I'm very pleased tonight to welcome Dr. Lloyd Knox. Uh, Dr. Knox is a professor of physics at the University of California, Davis. He did his PhD at the University of Chicago, went off to the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics in Toronto, and then back to Chicago and off to uh, Davis where he has uh, been on the faculty for several years. He has long been one of the leading scientists working to interpret cosmological data, especially microwave background data, in order to advance our understanding of the universe we live in. And so we're very excited to have him here tonight. He is uh, leading the US team, and in fact, one of the leaders of the world team to extract cosmological information uh, from the data from the Planck satellite of the European Space Agency. And tonight he will tell us about confirmed truths and remaining mysteries regarding the origin of the universe. Dr. Knox. Thanks, Glenn. It's, it's a real honor to get to talk here in, in this museum. We, we arrived uh, a little while ago, and Glenn took me right away to show me Lucy. And it was just uh, fascinating to get to look at the stuff around there and, and just think about how people are, you know, from the clues they have, are managing to, to you know to, re, to to construct this this story, um, and uh, I want to do a similar thing here. Tell you an extraordinary story, um, but also tell you why, despite the fact that it's so extraordinary, um, what I'm telling you is um, not controversial at all. At all. So my claim tonight is, uh, and it's a claim, as I said, is not controversial among my community, is that you know, the the universe used to be hotter, denser, smoother, in a way I'll explain, and expanding more rapidly than it is today, and that these are indeed confirmed truths. That, that we have sufficient evidence that, that I believe these, these claims qualify as confirmed truths. Amazingly, we can actually directly see the universe in this earlier state, and to Explain how that is, I'm going to show you uh, an animated cartoon. First, I'm going to introduce you to the characters in the cartoon. So we have a, a hydrogen atom. A, a hydrogen is the simplest uh, atom there is. It's also 94% of the atoms in the universe are, are hydrogen. And uh, this plays a key role. Hydrogen's made up of a proton and, and an electron. And then the hero of our story is a particle of light, a photon. It looks like that. Now, if you, if you heat up hydrogen enough, it uh, f gets hot enough. It falls apart, and you just have, uh, uh, you don't have hydrogen atoms. You have it separated out into protons and electrons. So here, this is early enough in the history of the universe that it's, it's hot enough that this hydrogen gas that fills the universe is, um, is split apart like this. And these uh, photons. Uh, the particles of light don't travel very far at all because they have a strong tendency to bounce off of free electrons if they're around. So let me actually now run this uh, video. And we'll see the photons scattering off of the free electrons, not getting anywhere. But as the universe is expanding, it's cooling. And it gets cool enough that the electrons combine with the protons and the gas becomes electron free. The photon can start traveling. Photons can start traveling freely. We're going to follow one of them past the formation of the first stars, formation of the first galaxies. Now we're going to zoom out so we can see more, and this will pass a massive cluster of galaxies and get bent by the, all this mass pulling on it gravitationally. Now some of the photons will actually go through a cluster of galaxies, see free electrons again get scattered. Actually, most of them don't have this interesting a journey. Here's another 
gravitational lensing event of bending by all the mass here. Now it's headed right into the Milky Way galaxy, soon to be gobbled up by the Planck satellite coming in, boom. <laughs> And with the information from that photon and countless others, we can, from the Planck data, reconstruct this beautiful map showing what the universe looked like at the time of that transition from when the light was trapped by all those free electrons to when it could be traveling freely. A NASA, this, this uh, Planck mission is a European Space Agency mission with, with uh, a lot of contribution from, from NASA as the credits are showing here. So with this map from the Planck satellite, we are directly seeing a slice of the universe that is now 46 billion light years away, when the universe was just 380, 300, actually 370,000 years old, compared to an age today of about 13.8 billion years, a thousand times hotter, almost a million times denser, and, and millions of times smoother. Let me, let me explain the smoother part. And, uh, and before getting to that, let me tell you, this doesn't look too smooth. But that's because we've, we've really increased the contrast on this image. The, the red areas are, are denser and hotter by one part in just 100,000 than, than the blue areas. So this is actually a very smooth um, density field. This is more what it, the early universe looked like, right? Just completely homogeneous, right? There's, there's small variations in here of one part in 100,000, but you can't see them. They're, they're, they're so small. There are those variations there, though. And, and where there's a little more matter, the gravity's stronger. It pulls stuff in from regions where there's less matter. And, and uh, that's a runaway process. And gravity amplifies those small fluctuations over time. As you can see here, as I run this along, so as the universe is expanding, these, the, these denser regions are pulling matter in, and you go from those smooth conditions to a much lumpier uh, universe like this. Each of, these, each of these globs here you can think of as uh, uh, a galaxy hosting stars and, and planets. So we go from these highly homogeneous, very smooth conditions over time to the lumpier universe that we know today. So here are my claims that we, we, we evolved from this hotter, denser, smoother, more rapidly expanding state. And this raises the question, how is it possible we have been able to figure all this out? It's a pretty extraordinary, right? We're claiming that we know what was happening 14 billion years ago. So how is this possible? So one thing that I think is tremendously important to this being possible is that it turns out, this wasn't always clear, but it started to become clear a few hundred years ago, 400 years ago, very simple rules apply to everything everywhere. It's possible to discover these rules. So by observing, experimenting, and thinking, one can figure these rules out. And then a last point that I think is really important is that the heavens are actually quite rich with information. So there's, there's, there's more information in the sky with the light coming to us from the rest of the universe than you might at first think. Now what I'm going to do is tell you a story starting from Newton and involving a number of other characters and winding our way into the 20th century and into the 21st century with our modern understanding of cosmology. So let's start with Newton. So here are some simple rules that Newton discovered that came out of exper experiments he did, experiments other people did, observations people made of, of, the, of the planets. And it doesn't, for my purposes here, it doesn't matter too much what these rules are saying. It's important that they're really simple. And they have to do with the laws of motion. These are his laws of motion and his, his law of gravity. What do I mean by simple? Well, let's compare it to something more complex. So these are very simple rules. I'm sorry to remind you about this so soon before tax time. So this is really an amazing accomplishment of, of Newton's. 
So let me just, let me illustrate that with the following. So we could write down Mercury's location as seen from Earth over time. So this is time elapsing here in this column. And this is the, how astronomers describe location on the sky. And it's changing over time. So I've just shown a little bit here. You know, Newton had a ton of data like this uh, to, um, uh, to see, as did others work with. And, and this can be explained with much less data. So Mercury's location and velocity at just one time. And then Newton's rules, those simple rules you saw, for calculating its location at all other times. And further, these aren't just some set of rules for Mercury and another set of rules for something else. It's the same rules apply to all the planets. And then if that weren't enough, actually this rule applies to everything. Right? So it has to do with, with uh, how apples are attracted to the Earth. This is a truly universal law, and it's a law of gravitation. So now our story skips ahead to 1845. Here's a diagram of some objects in our solar system. And back in 1845, neither Neptune nor Pluto were, were known about, but Uranus was. And uh, Leverrier, this French, uh, Frenchman named Urbain Leverrier, uh, did some calculations. He said, OK, how should Uranus be moving, given Newton's laws? And let me move him out of the way for a second here, because he's blocking the sun. Uh, Uranus gets a large, big pull from the sun, gravitational pull, but everything else is pulling on it too. So Jupiter's pulling on it, uh, Saturn's pulling on it, and those all affect its motion to some degree. So what Leverrier did was uh, calculate, using Newton's laws of motion, how Uranus should be moving based on where everything else was. And he found something interesting. He found that that if he compared his prediction for how Uranus should move with what it was actually doing, uh, that there was a difference. So, so th this motion was inconsistent with Newton's laws and the known heavenly bodies. And uh, he had a solution to this. He said, well, this could be explained if there were a new planet that we haven't discovered yet. And uh, by the way, this is where you should look for it. So he told people where to look for it. Johann Gall went and looked there and, and discovered Neptune. So this is, this is, a, this is a, you know, this is amazing uh, vindication of Newton's description, uh, his laws of motion and uh, law of gravity, that you could, you could uh, discover new planets in this way. So that's quite an accomplishment. But 13 years later, um, I mean, Leveria could have been content with this, but uh, he was, 13 years later, he was thinking to himself, well, yeah, but what have I done lately? So he set about thinking about Mercury. Now, Mer here, here's a diagram showing Mercury's motion over time. This is the sun here. And Mercury travels on an ellipse, but then this ellipse slowly rotates with time. We call that a, a precession. So, so it's orbiting like this, and it processes. And exactly how it processes depends on what the other planets are doing uh, and, and the gravitational forces from, from the other planets. So he calculated, uh, based on what the other planets are doing, how Mercury should be moving. And he found that the rate of this precession was off by 1 10,000th of a degree per year from his calculations. So this was a precision calculation, I mean, done in, 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 the, you know, in 1859, uh, compared to precision observations. And you know, if I'd gotten this result, I would have thought, well, right, I got it right. You know, I mean, that's, this is tiny. But uh, apparently, you know, the, the, the uncertainties were small enough that this was worth taking seriously. And um, he tried to solve this in the same manner. He said, well, there's, uh, if there were a planet that he called Vulcan in this region, and called Vulcan um, because it would be very hot, and it's you know, the, the god of volcanoes, that, to look for a planet that's close to the sun. And 
Uh, that, if there were such a planet here, it could, it could explain this discrepancy. Well, and so this, however, is not the list of planets you learned in school, right? And, and right, so the truth is Vulcan is fictional. <laughs> and this motion, actually, it's an interesting story. There's more to it, I and mean, you can look it up. A number of people actually found the planet Vulcan. It's, it's hard to take measurements of the sky and actually figure out what's, what's going on. This all got sorted out, right? But uh, there are a number of claims of actually finding planet Vulcan, but none of them stood up. The motion of Mercury was not understood until Einstein figured it out in 1915. Amazingly, the path toward figuring this out took us through experiments with electricity and magnetism. Experiments with electricity and magnetism here on Earth actually helped to sort out this puzzle of how Mercury moves. So people were doing experiments with electricity and magnetism. And the results of those experiments, what's happening there, could be understood, again, with some, some simple rules. Now, they, I know these, these are getting more complicated looking than, than Newton's rules. But this is, remember, compared to the US tax code, right? This, is, this, is, this can be written very compactly. That's what I mean uh, by the simplicity. And so it was James Clerk Maxwell who managed to synthesize all of these experiments into these equations. What this had to do with gravity is that it turns out that these sets of equations are inconsistent. So you know, combining these equations, you could do uh, a calculation one way to predict the result of an experiment and get one answer, or you could do the calculation another way and get a different answer. So that's a problem, right? Only, there, there should be only one right answer. And um, so Einstein worked at solving this um, inconsistency, and in doing so, he radically modified our understanding of gravity and space and time. Nothing got changed really with, with Maxwell's equations, but our understanding of gravity and space and time gave way uh, so that we had a theory that was consistent with Maxwell. Now I should add at this point, this doesn't, I don't view this as showing that Newton was wrong. In some way, you know, in Einstein's theory, if you have things moving sufficiently slowly, they're, they're, they're far enough apart, this explains the, you know, why Newton's laws work so well. It was only you know, looking at Mercury that was moving fairly fast and was and, and over a shorter distance that, that the, the effects um, were apparent um, that are important for Einstein's theory. So this theory reconciled gravity with Maxwell and did so elegantly. It successfully explained this behavior of Mercury without adding in anything extra to do so. So just imagine for a moment, you're Einstein, you've worked out this theory that reconciles Maxwell and Newton, and you know there's this problem with Mercury, and you go and you do the calculation, and you find that it actually works. That's, that's quite an extraordinary event. Well, he knew about this problem. Even, even more interesting, perhaps, he successfully predicted how light should fall in a gravitational field. And his prediction differed by a factor of two from, from Newton's. And this was actually confirmed during a 1919 eclipse of the sun that allowed people to see uh, how starlight was getting deflected by the mass of the sun. So let me tell you a little bit about Einstein's equations. We'll start with this one, which is you know, the single most popular well-known equation in physics. This was Einstein's platinum hit. And, uh, Somehow, his 1915 equations just didn't catch on as well. <laughs> Not sure why. Um, so these are, these are the uh, field equations of general relativity. And let me just tell you um, roughly what's going on here. So the things over here describe the properties of space. And here's Newton's gravitational constant. And, and this is mass and energy here. And the takeaway is this, that, that matter, or matter and energy, affect the properties of space. And this is really important to understanding the Big Bang. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. 
So here's an example of matter changing the properties of space. And this was, this, this, this is, uh, we're gonna use work here by uh, Carl Schwarzschild, who worked this out in the trenches during World War I, soon after Einstein's 1915 paper came out. So you learned in school, and it's still true for a circle with no mass inside it, that the circumference of a circle with radius r is, is 2 pi r. And however, what Carl Schwarzschild worked out with Einstein's equations was, if you have some mass in here, then space gets distorted and one of the consequences of that is that the circumference is actually less than 2 pi r. Now you haven't noticed this, well probably because you haven't been actually measuring uh, <laughs> to check this rule, but also because it's a very small effect, right? So the fact that we've got the Earth in here has a very tiny correction to the circumference of the moon's orbit. So this is, this is a small effect. But let me uh, uh, help you visualize what's going on here with the assistance of J.K. Rowling Who's, who's imagined this effect. So this is a, this is a tent that they uh, pitched on some Quidditch field, or outside some Quidditch, not Quidditch. What's, what's what, yeah, Quidditch. <laughs> um, and, and inside the tent, it's, if you're inside the tent, you think, well, this is a nice spacious tent. There must be a very large outside to this tent, right? The boundary around this must be large. J.K. Rowling imagined that being possible, that you could, have, you could have this much volume in here, and yet the surrounding actually be small. And this violates our intuition of how space works. But mathematicians can, can describe spaces that behave in this way. And given the right matter configuration, you might be able to construct something like this. So this is what I mean by Einstein radically changing our understanding of the nature of space. Now, these are indeed complicated equations. Although these are in some ways simple, solving them can be very, very difficult. These are not easy equations to solve. And so in order to solve these for the universe as a whole, Einstein, as well as others, made some simplifying assumptions. And he adopted uh, what he called the cosmological principle. And this is simply the idea that the universe is spatially homogeneous, that is, it's the same everywhere. Now, if you've looked at the night sky, you might think, why on the earth would you make that assumption about this universe, right? It looks that there's, this is not homogeneous at all, right? It'd be very different. The density here in interstellar space is very different than here right on a star. What's going on? Well, this is, this is something we often do in physics to, to, to try to calculate things. We make simple models. So modeling the universe as homogeneous is like modeling a cow as spherical. It's a great simplification, neglecting a lot of deta details. Here's a real cow at UC Davis, and here's an idealized model of a cow. So before I go any further with this um, idea of homogeneity, you may be uh, a practical group of people. You want to know, well, is this, is, is, is this going to describe our universe at all? Right? Is, is there any way in which calculations based on a homogeneous universe really describe our universe at all? And, and yes, it turns out it does. So this is the basis, of, this is from a computer simulation, but it does describe our uh, observations we've made quite well. This is um, 13 billion light years across here. And on large enough scales, the universe is, is fairly homogeneous. And what I mean by that is if we you know, took a box here and counted uh, the amount of matter, added up the amount of matter in it over here, and then took a box of the same size over here and, counted the, and, and added up the amount of matter in it, we'd get this, as long as that box was the same size, we'd get roughly the same answer. If, however, we do that with smaller boxes and just look at what's going on on smaller scales, so we're zooming out here to look at, look at this in, in, it's on smaller and smaller scales, Right, a box here, um, you get a different answer of how much mass is there than if you look here. So on small scales, yes, the universe is highly inhomogeneous. But on large enough scales, it's, it is highly homogeneous. And also, as I told you at the beginning, at early times, it's highly homogeneous. So this is a, this is a, a model of the universe 
Certainly neglecting a lot of details, but it's, it's something that would, should tell us about how our universe behaves on large scales. So, so a Russian, an American, and an Englishman, and a Catholic priest walk into a homogeneous universe. <laughs> and they all do calculations. And they all independently find space must either be uniformly increasing or uniformly decreasing. Okay, what does this even mean? Um, so let's talk about the expansion of space for a moment. So um, this gentleman in the hat there in that row, you may be about 10 meters away from me. Let's, let's assume as a thought experiment that this room, the space in this room is expanding at the rate of 10% per hour. So at the end of the hour, if you're 10 meters away from me now, you'll be one more meter away from me. It'll be like you're, we're moving apart from each other at a speed of one meter per hour. And then somebody near the back might be 30 meters away. Space is expanded by 10%, so you're going to be th three more meters away at the end of the hour. You're moving away from me at a rate of three meters per hour. So with this creation of space happening everywhere, uniformly, we expect that things that are further away from us, the distance between us and them will be, will be increasing more rapidly. Edwin Hubble and, uh, um, looked at a bunch of galaxies. And I don't have time to tell you how these measurements were made, but measured their distance away from us in megaparsecs. A megaparsec is 3 million light years. So that's the distance light travels in 3 million years. And he, he, so, so every, every point on here is a galaxy, right? So there was a galaxy in his survey that was about one megaparsec away, and it was moving away from us at a speed of about 800 kilometers per second. So he plotted up these galaxies like this and said, I have discovered the expansion of the universe, right? This effect of the expansion, that objects that are further away are moving away from us at a faster rate. Now, Einstein actually, uh, you know, he wasn't part of the people entering that uh, homogeneous universe, right, in, in, the, in the joke. He actually cooked up his equations to try to get a static universe. He had a philosophical attachment to the universe being static. He, he vigorously resisted this. He told uh, Lemaitre, the Catholic priest, that uh, he said, your equations are correct, but your physics is abominable. So his intuition, which had guided him so well in other areas, was failing him here. And it's, it's, um, uh, it's really too bad, uh, because if he, had, um, if he had managed to predict the expansion of the universe, he would have been really famous. <laughs> here he is. So he did have a sense of humor, but he didn't go along with that, that joke. So here's my cartoon drawing of, uh, of Hubble's data. And this is using V for speed. This is this relationship between speed and distance. In the thought experiment in the room, this constant here that we call H0 was 0.1 per hour. So that was the rate that this room was expanding. One of the reasons you haven't noticed the expansion of the universe is that the universe expands at a rate of one part in 10 billion per year. So that's, right, that's a very slow uh, expansion. The way that we usually talk about this um, is in these units. And what this means is that in every megaparsec of space, there's 67 new kilometers created every second. Now, if the universe is expanding, all that new space is diluting the stuff, right? So the, the density, is, which is just you know, like you know, mass per unit volume, is dropping with time due to the expansion of the universe. So if you extrapolate this backwards, it was denser in the past. And if you do that extrapolation using Einstein's field equations and what we, what we know about the universe is made out of, then, then you reach that time, a finite time, in, in, the, in the past. This, region of very high density 
is what, we, what gets commonly referred to as the Big Bang. Now, why believe in the Big Bang? Um, one is this theory that I told you about, that, that Einstein's theory of space and time created to, uh, as part of synthesizing the results of experiments and observations, it had nothing to do with the expansion of the universe, gave a very nice theoretical home to accommodate Hubble's data. This wasn't a difficult thing for Hubble to understand, right? This, was, this has already been worked out. It was, it was worked out, this is what should happen in a homogeneous universe according to Einstein's field equations. Now I'm going to go on to another important um, reason for uh, why we believe the universe used to be in this hot and dense state, and that has to do with uh, where the elements came from. Most of, this is, this is a distribution of atoms in the universe by mass, so um, most of it is hydrogen, there's some helium, almost nothing else. In fact, the astronomer's periodic table is a lot easier to remember than the chemist's table. It goes hydrogen, helium, and then everything else gets called metals, <laughs> including oxygen. So, but how can we know? How can we know? I mean, most of the universe is very far away. We can't actually go out there and get samples. How do we know what the stars are made of? How do we know what the universe is made out of? And this question occurred to the philosopher Auguste Comte, and in 1835 he said, we shall never be able by any means to, to study the, their chemical composition, talking about stars. You know, we're not going to be able to know what they were made out of. And what, well, he was wrong. He greatly underestimated the richness of the information and the light freely falling down on us. In fairness, I have to now mention that I have written one paper um, in my life so far that said uh, we, will not, we, we will never measure this particular thing better than this particular precision. And it was not very long at all until I discovered I was wrong. <laughs> so similar things happened to me. But he greatly underestimated the richness of the information and the light uh, coming down on us from the sky. So it's very rich. So if we, if, if we right, take light, we can break it up into its different colors. We all, we all seen that phenomenon with, with rainbows. Let's take a closer look at a rainbow. Here's a slightly closer look at a rainbow. And pulling in even closer, we actually don't see a continuous spectrum. There's regions that are dark. Walton discovered these in 1802. Fifteen years later, Fraunhofer rediscovered them, Fraunhofer, and we call these Fraunhofer lines, which brings, raises the really important question, how did, how did Walton feel about this? All right, but what are these dark regions coming from? So here's, if we, if we, if we have a, a source of a continuous um, spectrum of light, so all the colors, and then we shine it through some cool gas, the atoms in here will absorb particular colors of light. And so what comes out will be something like this, where there's particular uh, colors absorbed, and this has to do with, with the structure of atoms. If the cool gas is hydrogen, you get the above, above uh, spectrum. So where there's absorption happening here, 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 and here. So which, are, which ones are hydrogen lines? Are there hydrogen lines in here? Let's compare them. So um, this line's up here, right? So there's, this line seems to be in the spectrum, this one, this one, this one. So it looks like there's hydrogen in the, in the sun. All these, these other lines come from other known elements. Another interesting story is that helium gets its name because it was actually discovered from observing the sun and uh, was hypothesized that these lines that no one could understand where they came from, the particular absorption, or, or particular lines from, from helium um, were due to some new element that hadn't been discovered yet. And uh, that extraordinary explanation turned out to be correct. And that's why helium is called helium from the Greek word helios. But that's a digression. 
So this is what we're made out of. And uh, the atoms that compose the rest of the universe, I'm saying, are like this. So one natural question you might ask is, OK, hydrogen's the simplest atom there is, but why is there all this helium? Where did the helium come from? This is a question that occurred to George Gamow that he set to work on. This is a picture of him before he did his best work. <laughs> and Gamow uh, thought, well, maybe when the universe was really dense, the, um, that's, when, that's when the helium was formed. So he and his student, Alpher, uh, set to working out um, knowing what they knew about nuclear physics and how protons and neutrons interacted with each other, uh, could, would helium form under these conditions? And there's a very important conclusion of their work. By the way, before I get to their important conclusion, Gamow had a really great sense of humor. And here he was, his name, which sounds very much like gamma, the third letter in the Greek alphabet. He was working with Alf Alpha, which sounds a lot like the first letter in the Greek alphabet, Alpha. And Hans Bethe was a very famous astrophysicist um, and contemporary and of theirs. And uh, so they were writing this paper, Alpha and Gamow, about you know, the beginning of the universe. And uh, they, Gamow just added Bethe's name to the paper before they sent it to the Physical Review. Physical review. So it was by Alpha, Bethe, and Gamow. OK. So they could get helium out of the Big Bang. But in order to get more helium than is seen, and in fact more than uh, heavier elements also, the Big Bang had to be hot. So I'm not going to explain why they are forcing this conclusion. But in order to get the right answer, to be consistent with observations, the Big Bang had to be not only dense, but hot. And hot things, as it turns out, emit light. And that's very important for our story. Uh, so you've all seen this. It used to be that light bulbs generated light in this way, uh, heating up a filament here that, that then, because it was hot, gave off light. Um, and here's a, a stove element. So you've seen this. And the, and the sun, the reason the sun is so bright is because it's hot and big. So this is a really important uh, um, part of the rest of our story. That heat that was needed to make this helium, and not too much, uh, led to a prediction uh, that was confirmed with this discovery of the microwave background. So let me um, explain that. Uh, so here, here is, in this cartoon, this is the light from the heat of the Big Bang, this light in here. And, and Right, we went through this transition when the light couldn't travel to all of a sudden it was free to travel. That's what this light is that we were measuring with the Planck satellite is the light from, this, from the heat of the Big Bang that had to be there to make the helium. So that there is this microwave background was, was predicted by Gamow's work and subsequently, subsequently discovered in 1964, um, 50 years ago. So let me tell you what we're looking about with, about with these maps of the microwave background. So this transition from uh, this, when the photons were trapped in the universe to when they could travel freely, that transition happened everywhere in the universe, basically at the same time. And so I've, I'm trying to give that effect of what the universe looked like right after this transition by just tiling my screen with this, with this same image. Let's say that the Earth's going to form here. So this is, you know, this is some large section of the, of the universe. We're seeing it at one point in time. Later on, the Earth's going to form here. Let's think about where this light goes to. Some of, it will be, some of it's headed in our direction, right? It heads off in all directions. The stuff we're going to see, we have a hope of seeing, is headed our direction. But I've drawn this, drawn this circle so close that, that by the present epoch, any light headed our direction actually has passed by. So we don't see this region of the universe from that time. And then we can imagine a circle far enough away that the light from this region that happened to be headed towards us hasn't gotten to us yet. There hasn't been enough time for that. 
And then here's the Goldilocks region that I've chosen so that the light that left this region that hap happened to be headed in our direction is just getting here now. So this, is, this, this region of the universe is what we see when we look at a map of the microwave background. So what does it look like? Well, to orient you here, here's the optical sky at night. Uh, you can barely see the stars, but at least there's these labels you also can't see. Um, so this is observing light uh, that has a wavelength of, of half a thousandth of a millimeter. This is visible light that we can see with our eyes. This light from the Big Bang, the heat of the Big Bang, has been stretched by the expansion to be um, microwave wavelengths, same kind of light that is in your microwave oven heating up your food. The color here indicates the brightness of the, of the light. And this incredible uniformity here, this, this, this very uniform image, is due to the fact that the universe used to be highly homogeneous. Now, Glenn mentioned that you know, I've, uh, a lot of my career has been based on interpreting this data. And you might think, how do you make a career out of interpreting something like this? Um, so it does get more interesting if you remove, um, if, if we turn up the contrast and can see the small variations that are in there. Again, uh, the, the um, redder regions are regions that are, that are brighter, hotter, and denser than these, than these darker regions. A satellite experiment before Planck made this full sky map of the microwave background. And now we'll just cut away part of this so you can get the picture of what's going on here. So here's, I put the Planck satellite in here. And we're making a map of this region of the universe that is now uh, 46 billion uh, light years away. And that's a, something for you to puzzle over. Actually, I said the universe was about 13.8 billion years. How can we be seeing light from something that's now 46 billion light years away? Now, in order to show these full sky maps, it's convenient to, to project them onto um, a flat surface like this. So here's a, a way of doing that you're, you're, you're familiar with, with the um, surface of the Earth. Here's the, the sky projected onto into this image, the full sky here. As I said, this was made by the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Here's the map we have from the Planck satellite. And um, you, might, uh, you might wonder, and it looks very similar. The only reason the colors are different is because we changed the color scale. And you might wonder, why did you fly a $800 million satellite just to change the color scale? Um, so let me explain something about what's new with, with, with Planck. And a prediction of what is our, now our standard model of, of cosmology. And so I'm going to show you um, a statistical property of the map. And I don't expect you to understand what this means, except I want you to know what on here is data and what on here is theory. OK, so the data are these things with um, these, these vertical lines here. The extent of this represents some uncertainty in how well it's measured. So WMAP measured this thing we call a power spectrum really well out here. And, and, then, and then this smooth curve going through here is a theoretical model. And actually, it's, it's not just a theoretical model. It's, it's actually a prediction of the model. If, if you let the, if you let the there's various knobs you can turn on this model. There's six, six knobs you can turn, six adjustable parameters, like how, mu like how many uh, atoms there are in the universe, how much dark matter there is. If you adjust those and manage to agree with the WMAP data, then you always fall in this band out here. So this model is making a very tight prediction for what we should see out here, if we can measure out here. So again, this is. The, where do the measurements come from? By measuring the map, we can, this has to do with uh, how, how smooth the map is on different length scales. We can make this very tight prediction. And 
Now let's see what happens. Before Planck, we had some uh, ground-based experiments measuring out here, and they fall pretty much right on this model, consistent with these model predictions. And then with Planck, they fall right on there again, and now we, we can't even see what's, how well this is going in. Let me zoom in here, and we can see these predictions being traced extraordinarily well by, by our measurements. There's many more things from the Planck CMB map, such as an almost full sky map of the, of the mass in the universe. So these microwave background photons have been affected by, by the, the, the mass in the universe deflecting them around, not as dramatically as shown here in the, in the cartoon. Um, but by teasing out those effects, we can make this map of the um, mass in the universe. So in a, in a darker region, in that direction, there's more mass than in in, in a lighter region. So, if I stopped here, you might have the impression that all, everything was all in hand, everything well understood. Um, it is indeed amazing to me the degree to which our models can predict what we're going to um, find with precision measurements. What are the mysteries? Well, we don't know how the Big Bang got started. All right, we can extrapolate backwards at a certain point, we know not to trust our extrapolations. We don't know why there was a Big Bang. We don't know why there's something rather than nothing. Also, this expansion of space, we expected that it would be slowing down over time. Indeed, we have observations that can only make sense if over most of the history of the universe, the expansion rate was decreasing. Well, the expansion's actually speeding up, is what we found more recently, it's the, the, the expansion rate is accelerating. We don't know why this is. Is this, actually you can get that. I said Einstein put something in his theory to make a static universe. Depending on how that's done, you can also, that can cause acceleration, putting in his, this cosmological constant. But why does it have the value it does? Why, why does it work out that way? Again, we don't know um, why there is an excess of matter over antimatter in the universe, which there definitely is or we wouldn't be here. We don't know what the dark matter is. I showed you this description of what the universe is made out of, but that was hiding the fact that what we believe is that atoms, the stuff we really understand, are only about 5% of the total mass energy budget of the universe. So most of the mass and energy in the universe, at least for our models to, 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 to be able to reproduce data have a lot of what we call dark matter, a lot of what we call dark energy, and um, we don't know what these things are. Remember Vulcan? So um, Le Verrier predicted that because using his gravitational theory, he said in order for Newton's laws in his law of gravity, to make sense, there has to be this planet Vulcan. Well, actually, that wasn't the answer, right? The answer was we had the wrong theory of gravity. So one of the questions is, uh, yeah, with, with using Einstein's theory of gravity, we need these things. Is that just because we have the wrong theory of gravity? And, and, and we, um, actually, there's, there's some correction to Einstein's theory of gravity that applies at very large scales. We don't know. So to summarize, how can we know so much about 13.8 billion years ago? Key to this is that there are simple laws that apply to everything everywhere. These allow for us to infer things, things that we cannot see. It allows for us to infer what's happened in the past and, and what will happen in the future. And also that the light in the heavens is really rich. We get a lot of data um, from the observations we conduct. So inferring the unseen from the seen is something that, that happens all the time. You're people gathering clues to figure out what happened. This is, this is uh, of course, a fictional TV show. Well, I suppose it's a real TV show, but it's, it's fiction here. But the fact that you can actually manage to infer the unseen or not yet seen from what you can see is true. It's a real and very interesting property of the universe. Remember what happened with Neptune. Second summary, don't worry, there's, I stop at three. So I claim the Big Bang is a confirmed truth, as I describe the Big Bang. 
we have the theoretical context for this description that's provided by Einstein, a context that was created to synthesize the results of experiments and observations. We have the distance speed relation observed by Hubble, which is what we expect from an expanding universe. Thinking about what might have happened in that, in that early denser, denser phase of the universe, Gamow and people following in his footsteps have been able, able to calculate how much helium there should be, how much deuterium there should be, and these agree with our observations. And this led to a prediction. This only works if the early universe was hot, and that heat is observed today in the microwave background, something that we have studied in tremendous detail. And it's extraordinary how well this works out. The, 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 the agreement you're seeing there makes a very strong case that the universality of these laws applies across the entire observable universe. Atoms at the edge of the observable universe are just like the atoms here on Earth. Many mysteries remain, right? Dark matter, why is the universe accelerating? Why these laws? Why laws at all? How did the Big Bang get started? So, Planck has confirmed the precise predictions of this standard model, which is somewhat like the discovery of Neptune, confirming Newtonian theory. One never knows, though, when precision measurement and precision prediction will reveal something interesting, as it did with the anomalous motion of Mercury. And you can bet that even better measurements are underway, and we're excited about taking this quest further. Let me leave you with this screen here. In case you want more, there's some reading recommendations. Uh, and there's even some online set of videos that I think are, are, might be useful. Thank you very much for your, your attention here tonight. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I don't know how we moderate this. So, so we, we have some mics going around the audience. And so if you just let the people walking up and down the aisles know that we have a question. I can't see as well as you can. Maybe you can um, acknowledge people. Yeah, no, I have a microphone. You had the pie chart where you were showing. Yeah, I, it looked like you were on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you had the pie chart that you were showing. The, yeah, that one. The dark matter and dark energy and ordinary matter. What is an ordinary energy part of this pie chart? Oh, 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 oh. Be, um, right. So it's a, it's a tiny little sliver. It, yeah. So remember that most famous equation in, in all of physics, E equals mc squared? So, so this, this matter corresponds to a tremendous amount of, of energy. All right. So, so if, if we were adding, if we were going to add up, uh, for example, um, I don't know, what kind of energy were you thinking of? Uh, so um, let's just think about the energy that's, that, that's in the microwave background. Right, so there's, there's energy in, in the microwave background um, that, that, that fills just, you know, that, that's a tiny, tiny fraction of the total matter slash energy budget. Another way of putting it, if, this, if all the ordinary matter were to convert to, to energy, uh, that would dwarf all the existing energy, uh, um, other, th other than <laughs> other than these things, you know, in, in, in the universe. A better way to put it is is if we convert it, you know, if we convert that energy into matter units by dividing by the speed of light squared, it shows up as a tiny sliver in this budget. It's just not important. Hello. I was surprised to hear you uh, say um, uh, the mystery at the end. Uh, why or how is it that there is uh, anything more rather than nothing? Right. And this seems more like a question of philosophy than physics. And I was curious: Do you believe that physics can ever have any traction on such a question? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's. I wouldn't rule it out. Um, uh, but it's also not something that I would, you know, focus my career on trying to solve. Um, so I think it's uh, unlikely that that would happen anytime soon. Maybe it'll happen never. But I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. 
Have you heard of any physicists studying such a thing? Yeah, yeah, and and it's all terribly speculative. And 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 what I've tried to so those are definitely mysteries, and there and there are speculations. Um, uh, and what I've wanted to focus on here mostly tonight was what are the things that 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 we know for sure, as well as bringing up the the, the questions. Uh, uh, I have a question regarding the previous question about um, the dark matter and stuff. Uh, do we know if the Einstein equation um, works for dark matter and dark energy as well? So, um, in our model, they certainly do. <laughs> so, the, the, the Einstein's equations do for dark matter and dark energy. Now, um, and, and, and so now it's, it's important, well, what are the, how do we test that? And um, with, with dark matter, uh, I mean, I raised the question, I raised the question, um, so one of, the, one of the things we need dark matter for is for um, explaining the, if you look at a cluster of galaxies and you see the, um, uh, galaxies moving, moving around in the cluster. You, you can measure the speeds with which the galaxies are moving, and you can look at the um, galaxy. You can look at the, the stars that are there. Um, actually, because they glow in the X-ray, you can look at all the gas that's there. And if you take all the mass that that, that, that corresponds to that, you find it's not enough to keep those galaxies from just flying apart. So we know how fast they're moving, and if we just use the mass that we can see, the mass in atoms, uh, it's not enough to keep these galaxies from, from just flying away from the, the cluster. So we, uh, it was actually proposed in 1933 that there has to be this extra, extra matter in there uh, uh, to keep these galaxy clusters as bound systems. I mean, either you just happen to catch these galaxies while they happen to be whizzing past each other and happen to be in the same place where there also happened to be all this gas just at the right moment before they fly apart from each other or they're actually bound and they're, and they're, and they're rotating around, you know, they're, they're, they're moving through this, they're moving out of this gravitational well, falling back into it. They're moving so fast that we need a deep gravitational well to hold them. We need a lot of mass there to be pulling them back. And so that's one kind of, one, one piece of evidence for dark matter. And it's entirely doing its job there because it's, it's, it's sourcing the gravitational field. Uh, so did that address your question? <laughs> Does the universe have a center? Did the Big, big Bang occur at one spot? Great, thank you for asking that. Um, let's see. Oh, whoops, no, I don't want to go to the summary. Uh, so the quick answer is no. And so the universe that early on was highly homogeneous. So um, the same everywhere. Now I don't know whether it was it was finite or infinite. Glenn doesn't know either. <laughs> um, and. It possibly this goes on on forever, right? And I happen to put us here in the center because we're particularly interested in, in what things look like from our point of view. But you know, I could have put us over here or over here, and, and we'd get the same story. It kind of it can kind of look like we're at the center because we see everything moving away from us. But if you think about what it would be like to be somewhere else, so you're so you're somewhere else. And, and, and space is expanding, well, you're also seeing every, everything else move away from you. So it can kind of look like you're in the center because you see everything moving away from you, but every, everybody would see the same thing. So what Hubble saw is not evidence that we're at the center. Um, and uh, so uh, there, as far as we know, there aren't any you know, special points in the universe. Do you want to? 
I guess one comment the uh, physics is probably more likely to find an answer to that something rather than nothing than philosophy. These physicists actually do so. Um, question about the uh, uh, early cartoon with the photon. Uh, why is that light? I mean, I presume the photon started out as a simple photon. Why do we see it now as a uh, microwave? So, um, one of the consequences of having an expanding universe is that. Uh, if you have a completely homogeneous universe and you have this expansion, then the, the momentum of uh, a, a, the momentum of a particle slows de is decreases as the universe expands. Um, one way you can think of it is is uh, that the the wavelength of this is 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 getting stretched o over time, and and so it's it's those dynamics of the expanding universe that are um, we, we call this redshifting, you know, moving the light to longer wavelengths. Another way of thinking about it that works over short distances is that, is that the, you know, these things are moving away from us. And so, so uh, um, just like you can, hear, you can hear this phenomenon happen with sound, if you're having, having a, uh, a car moving towards you and then moving away from you, it can sound like, like this. Right. So this Doppler effect, and so um, that car moving away from you, that sound is shifted to lower frequencies, and these things moving away from us are shifted to lower frequencies as well. That's a description that only works on, on for small enough distances, but it's a, perhaps an easier one to digest. You raised this question yourself earlier. How do you account for a 13 million year old not a universe, but like 46 million miles away. Right, okay, good. So, uh, what's really important, so, so first of all, right, why, okay, so I'm saying we're re receiving light from this region uh, just now, and that, and that the distance from here to here is 46 billion light years. So, actually, the distance from here to here is a time-dependent thing, right? The space is expanding. When the light left from here, heading towards us, this was, I think, only tens of millions of light years away. But the, over the time that the light was traveling towards us, the universe has expanded a lot. Um, and actually by a factor of 1,000. So I said this was 46 billion light years away. Uh, it'd be a thousand, it was a thousand times closer when, when the light left. And so it's because of all the expansion that's taken place. This didn't just sit still here while the light was headed towards us. The, all this expansion was happening, increasing the distance between where we are and, and, this, and this region. One thing that's kind of interesting is that actually when this light started, started traveling towards us, Space was being created so rapidly in the intervening region that the distance between the light and us was actually increasing. So the light was headed our direction, but the distance it had to travel to get to us was actually increasing because space was being created so rapidly. But eventually, the expansion slowed down, and this particle of light was able to start making headway and finally get here. Thank you for coming from Davis. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I got tired of the warm weather. I know. And the lack of snow. You, that's right. And, and snow on the mountains. <laughs> I was wondering how dark matter and dark energy participated in the Big Bang, because listening to talks about and reading about dark matter and dark energy, they're kind of holding the glue that's holding us kind of together and all the large gravitational or large mass objects kind of together. But it's kind of counterintuitive for the dark matter and dark energy to allow the expansion, so to speak. So how, how did dark matter and dark energy participate in the Big Bang, it, or did they? Well, so um, let's see. Depending on what part of the Big Bang. So, so 
even when, you know, so even at this time, all right, at, the, at this transition from um, uh, this ionized universe, the, the one where the, there were protons and electrons to the one where there, that, that was combined into hydrogen atoms, even at this time, there was a lot more dark matter, a lot more mass in dark matter than, than in atoms, about six times uh, as much in dark, five or six times as much in dark matter as in atoms. So it was around, and uh, in the detail of how things evolved here de depends very importantly on that dark matter. And the presence of the dark matter at this early time is really important to getting those predictions right of what these microwave background maps should look like. Uh, so the dark matter was, was, was there. And in fact, if we extrapolate earlier in time, uh, there are, it, it may be the case that, that very, very early in, in the Big Bang, the dark matter was actually, was actually created. So there, that, that, that reactions could take place that, that, would, that would create the dark matter. So we have models of, of, of the dark matter um, uh, that, that uh, we have models of the dark matter where, where, they're, where they're created thermally, kind of just like, um, uh, just like the, the, the photons are, are created. Not only might you make photons when things are hot enough, but when things are hot and dense enough, you might make this dark matter too. And uh, so the dark matter may have an origin in the Big Bang. In fact, it, 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 it must if it exists. Now, I'm not sure, though. There is something about your question. Let's see. Let me say something about dark energy. Dark energy was not as important. So dark energy is this really strange thing. Uh, if it's the, the simplest model, at least to describe for dark energy, is that it's Einstein's cosmological constant. And the funny thing about this is that as, as space expands, it doesn't dilute. So one way of thinking about this is this could be that there's an energy density, a mass density, associated with every cubic centimeter of space. So as you create more space, you create more of this energy. So what that means is that it wasn't important early on uh, because Right, you've had all this e expansion diluting things except for the dark energy, and it's only recently that the dark energy has become an important part of, uh, of the energy budget of that pie chart. Right, so extrapolating things backwards, the, the density of matter gets a lot higher, but the density of the dark energy doesn't change. And so back at these early times, dark energy was a very, very tiny, small part of the, that total pie chart. light traveling um, to us. I, I had assumed, I guess, at some point that light that was, say, 10, 10 billion years old, um, it was about 10 billion light years away when it left, and now it was quite a bit further. Um, but it sounds to me it's almost like analogous with someone traveling the wrong way on a moving sidewalk, uh, going against the grain, so yeah. it was much closer. So if, it, if it, it's showing up at 10 billion years, uh, actually, was much closer than that when it technically left. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Thank you for coming. Uh, keep keep your eye out for more programs, both here at the museum and uh, specifically Institute for the Science of Origins programs at www.case.edu/origins and at www.cmnh.org. Thanks, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening at the museum. <laughs>